Okay, it is still the Wednesday afternoon Bible class, even though there is a new background behind me. Stay tuned, that may change several times, but the teaching goes on just the same. <laughs> so we are picking up in Romans chapter 11, and we're picking up at verse 25. Uh, what we're picking up with is the times of the Gentiles, but let me read from the beginning of the verse. It says, For I do not want you brethren to be uninformed. You may have, if you have a King James, you may have, I don't want you to be ignorant. And even though I said it last time, for any who didn't hear last class, it, I always laugh because it reminds me of Dr. McGee teaching my mom way back in the day when he would teach and he'd have that phrase, he'd say, I do not want you ignorant, brethren. <laughs> You've got to watch where you pause. <laughs> so I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. <laughs> and the brethren, of course, is male and female. He wants everyone to be informed. He doesn't want them to be uninformed of this mystery. Mystery in Scripture is something that hasn't been revealed before, but it's about to be revealed. It's a hidden purpose, or it's the counsel of God, that when it's revealed will then be understood by the believer. So what he's going to explain is something that could not be understood before, but now it's ready to be uh, unveiled. I don't want to say unhidden, because that's the wrong word, but it's being, it'll be brought out, okay? So, I, the reason why this is so important, why he wants them informed, is so that you, and he's talking to the brethren, you will not be wise in your own estimation. You won't be wise in your own conceit. You won't be self-opinionated and think that, that you have done something so great that you've merited this. He's going to show that, that the audience who is hearing these words has not done anything to make them, oh, wow, they deserve this. This is strictly what we're going to see on the basis of God's grace. But before we get to his grace, this is what he doesn't want them wise in their own estimation. That a partial hardening, and notice that key word, partial, that tells us right away it's not a complete and it's not forever. It is a partial hardening, a partial blindness. It's a mental dullness, something that they're just not being able to catch. A partial hardening has happened. It's, in, it's already there. It's not something that will happen sometime down the road in the future. It's at the current time that, that Shaul Paul was speaking. This partial mental dullness has happened to Israel, the nation of Israel, speaking as a whole, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Now that's where we left off in a hurry at the last class and where I wanted to pick it back up is we need to understand what the fullness of the Gentiles means. We have a couple of terms here and what we're talking about are two different things but they'll sound similar. You hear the term fullness of the, of the, the Gentiles and you hear the time of the Gentiles or it can even be plural, the times of the Gentiles. These are not synonymous. They're not to be interchanged and taken that way. The fullness of the Gentiles is talking about a body. When this body is complete, then something's going to happen. That fullness means a completeness. So when the completeness of the Gentiles has come in, what are we referring to? Well, let's look real quick for some help on that. Let's go to Acts 15 verses 14 to 17. Acts 15, verses 14 to 17. And in Acts 15, we read, starting with verse 14, Simeon, or Shimon, Simon, depending on how you pronounce it, has related, and this is Peter, Simon Peter, Kepha, okay, has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. Okay, so we're hearing about a time when God is concerned himself about bringing salvation to the Gentiles so that he can take from among the Gentiles a people who will believe in him and they'll take on his name. With words of the prophets, I'm sorry, with this the words of the prophets agree as just as it is written. That was verse 15, verse 16. After he's taken a group of Gentiles, people, Gentile peoples who have believed in him, then after these things, I will return. Okay, if you're returning, you've been somewhere before. 
So if we know he's called the God of Israel, and we know he's worked with Israel, he's worked with the Jewish people, he even put them in their promised land, they're out of the promised land due to rebellion, but he did not say he'd make an end of Israel, in fact, to the contrary, he promised he never would. So very likely what would make sense is he's returning to Israel, to the Jewish people as a whole. Let's see if that fits. Here's a description. After these things I will return, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen. Well, does that sound Jewish? I hope I hear a yes somewhere. <laughs> that sounds very Jewish. The tabernacle, what became the temple, the tabernacle was what moved in the wilderness, became the temple when they settled in Israel. That has broken down. We know that there isn't a Jewish temple right now. And the Lord is promising that he's going to restore it. Why is it referred to as the tabernacle of David? Because David, Mach David, King David, was, I'm going to say, the greatest king Israel had. He was a man after God's own heart. God made promises to him, and God's going to fulfill those promises. So he's looking and saying, I promised David, I promised David. And you can go to 1 Samuel, 1 Shmuel chapter 7, start with about verse 16, and you'll see where he promised a throne forever. And we know that when uh, the tabernacle, which actually will be called a temple, is rebuilt in the millennium, when the Lord is filling it, he will sit from there and rule the nations. So, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it. That sounds very Jewish. That sounds to me like Israel has a future in God's plan. And that's exactly what he is saying. So that the rest of mankind, the rest of the world, outside of Israel, may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who make these things known from long ago. So he's saying, I didn't just suddenly plan this. I didn't come up with plan B because I got a problem. What am I going to do with the Gentiles and with the Jews? And it didn't go out as I planned. No. God's plan has continued on exactly how he knew it would go, how he preordained for it to go. All man does is play into God's hand. But he has said and made it very clear, I am going to have Gentiles. They are going to be called by my name, and I will bring them in. When they're seeking the Lord, I'm going to bring them into the tabernacle of David. I'm going to bring them in with Israel, to Israel, and the world will know that I am the Lord their God. And he, will, he, he who will do this told about this long ago. He told Malch David, you will have one sit on your throne forever. That's at least 1000 BC. We're in 2000 AD. When this was written, even, it was in the first century AD. So it was at least 1000 years earlier when God promised David. So I think that's long ago. <laughs> but I think that we see that this all comes together. So we're seeing there's going to be a period of time. During that time, God's going to work with the Gentiles. You hear all about his working with Israel. That's what chapters 9, 10, and 11 have been telling us. God's working with Israel past, present, and what he will do with them in the future. But now here he's making it very clear. He's also got a work, a plan going on with the Gentiles. Right now Israel is in that partial blindness. While they are, I'm calling out a people for my name out of the Gentiles. When I have that number complete and that does not mean that no Gentile gets saved after this any more than it means no Jew can get saved today in the time in this fullness of the Gentiles waiting to be completed. I'm proof, Paul's proof that Jewish people were still getting saved. Gentiles will still be able to get saved but this body is going to be complete. When it's complete, when that number is complete and the Lord alone knows that last one who is going to get saved and be part of it then he's going to do something with them, but he's going to go back to that full plan of putting Israel into that head position. It's almost as if Israel's a train going down the track. The track has been sidetracked, so the train came over here for a time. There's another train that's gone by, this Gentile, and now this train is coming back in on that main track to go on down the road. And eventually we see those two groups of people in God's eternal plan 
are one together. They, they become one together during this time too, but we see the future in, in a complete way. I'll just put it that way. So that's pretty much what we're hearing right now. Now, if that's the fullness of the body, the body is what we call believers. When you come into saving faith in Yeshua Jesus, you become part of his body. Okay? We're not all little toes. We're not all fingers. We're not all eyes. And we're not all ears. We all have a different part in this body that we're considered one together because we're one in spirit. We're making up that one body. Sorry, Dora. <laughs> we're making up that one body. And when it's complete, we know from what Shaul Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, that's when he's going to call that body up they're going to go live with the Lord forever. We call that rapture. That's not second coming. Second coming means I've been here before. The first coming of Yeshua Jesus down to earth, not in Utah and not anywhere else, but in Israel. That's where he will come all the way down to the ground, put his feet on the Mount of Olives, and after he stops that battle, sets up his kingdom, in Jerusalem, Israel. That will be the second coming. At that time, when he's come his second time, Israel then will be raised up as a head nation. I ask you, is Israel a head nation today? Yes. No, it's not. No, no. Israel's a blessed nation by God. We see blessings on her. We also see her suffering consequences of not being right fellowship. But when I say head nation, is Israel able to call the shots to the world? Is Israel leading the world? No. Okay. God's head nation. Uh, Israel absolutely is God's head nation. Yes. <laughs> absolutely, Pam. You're right there. But we see, and it started all the way back at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, we see that there were what's called the times of the Gentiles, and many of you know Daniel's dream. Daniel's dream, Daniel chapter 2. We're going to look at just a few of the verses. If you're unfamiliar, read the whole thing entirely later. But you see that Babylon, which was the head nation of the world then, and Babylon is, is definitely not the Jewish nation. Babylon's not in Israel. Babylon's in Iraq. And they were head nation at the time. They were strong and powerful. Nebuchadnezzar was like a head of gold. As it goes down through the vision, you go from gold to silver to bronze to iron, and then you have iron and clay mixed. You see a weakening, but you still see these are the head nations. And the names given to them were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and revived Roman Empire. You don't hear a Jewish name in there, do you? Greece wasn't a Jewish nation. Rome is not a Jewish nation, anything but. What we have is a picture of the times that the Gentile nations will be ruling the world. We've moved far away from the time that Babylon was. We've come all the way through in history to knowing when Rome was, but yet we don't have Rome ruling now. We see, we see fingers from Rome, but we don't see in the way that we would call it a head yeah. nation. I'm sorry? It's coming together. But it's coming together because that iron mixed with clay, iron was Rome. We see a weakened Rome. We see a confederation. We've got ten toes that are going to come together, ten kings that are going to work together, and we're going to see other nations are swallowed up and, and a part of that because more than just the ten are there. I'm all over the book of Revelation. If you want it in detail, you've got a lot of reading to do. <laughs> but you get this synopsis, this overall view in Daniel. So let's Let's look real quick at Daniel chapter 2 and we're going to jump all the way down to verse 35. Daniel 2 and verse, actually let's back up to verse 32. Whoops, I hit the wrong button. Okay, Daniel, Daniel in Hebrew, Daniel 2 and verse 32 and we read the head of the statue. Okay, I really kind of gave you that. So 32, 33, 34 tells you that all these that I told you, the, the gold, silver, bronze, iron, and then iron and clay. What's key, though, is looking as Daniel's in his dream, as this image is being seen, actually it was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but Daniel's going to interpret it. But as he's looking, verse 34 is key. You continued looking at this huge statue, 90 feet tall. You're looking at this huge statue until a stone was cut out without hands. 
It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed. All at the same time became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, that's our whole dream. Drop down before I may say my part. Look at verses 44 and 45. We'll let Daniel interpret and then I'll just add in what I, I need to. In the days of those kings, oh, that's what Roger's doing. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, home can see that also. He's got the statue there. Okay. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. That kingdom will not be left for another people. It's not going to be run over and another people take over like we've seen. Rome, I mean, sorry, Babylon got taken over by Medo Persia. Medo Persia got taken over by Greece, etc., down the line. That's not going to happen anymore. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king, to Nebuchadnezzar, what will take place in the future so that the dream is true, its interpretation is trustworthy. Well, if you wonder if that dream is true, if you've seen the gold, the silver, the iron, the uh, bronze, the iron, all come true, then you can pretty well figure the iron and clay is going to show up and it's going to be destroyed. Now, what destroys it? Remember when we read earlier in the verses 32 to 35, we read about a stone. A stone that was cut out without hands. A rock is another good name for a stone. And if I called it the rock, it might cue you into who we're talking about. Notice it's cut out without hands. That's talking miraculous. That takes us to a virgin birth. Yeah. Now, if you take that in your mind, you know who's called the rock or the stone in scripture. You know he has a miraculous birth. You know that he is greater than any of these nations. You know that he is going to rule and reign. You know that he's working out his eternal plan even now. And you have the one who brings all these nations down. And that is Messiah. And when he comes the second time, first time in that virgin birth, the stone cut out without hands, and the stone now polarizes that statue when it's time for it all to fall, and it falls finally at the Battle of Armageddon when all the nations that have come at, 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 to battle against Israel will be destroyed, will be stopped, and Israel will be raised up as a head nation. That stone fills the whole face of the earth. In Scripture, a stone filling the face of the earth, looking like a mountain, which I think is what it was called in, yes, verse 35. The, the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain. Mountain in scripture means a government. So you have this stone now ruling, governing the entire world. We know that's Messiah sitting on the throne of David, the tabernacle of David, restored. You have your complete picture. That's the times of the Gentiles come to an end. When the Gentiles are no longer to be the head nation ruling, who does God have left? The Jews. If he fully was done with Israel, who would he put there? Because on this earth, there's two groups of people. You're either Jewish or you're Gentile. <laughs> so if God's done with the Jews, throws them away, wants no more of them, doesn't fulfill his promises to them, he's got a problem. Because now he's saying the Gentiles are done in their ruling, and he's going to sit as Messiah on the throne in Israel. Obviously, he is not done with Israel. He is not done with the Jewish people. He is going to make them head nation, and he will rule the world. A thousand years of peace for the millennial kingdom, but then we know that he will rule continually forever. And don't miss the fact that there are nations during the millennium. We're told Egypt is still a nation. If Egypt doesn't come up, she's not going to get rain. She's got to come up when? She's going to come up three feast days of Israel to bring in her first fruits to the temple to come and worship the one true and living God so that he will bless her nation, the nation of Egypt, with rain. Why do they need rain? Do you want crops? 
If you want crops, you need rain. <laughs> Do you want to eat? <laughs> you need rain, okay? So we see God has an eternal plan. And this is what he is showing and what he is fulfilling. So when Paul refers to this, and we're going back now to Romans 11. When Paul refers to this as the times of the Gentiles, uh, I'm sorry, refers here as the fullness of the Gentiles. He's not saying all the times of the Gentiles are over, but he's saying when God is working through the Gentile people for them to carry the message of salvation to the world, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile, Romans 1.16, then he's going to go back to that main thrust of using Israel as the, the, uh, the uh, what's my word? He's going to work through them to bring his message to the rest of the world. Okay? I derailed myself because I thought of something and I lost it a second time already. Um, where are we on the statue? On the statue, we're waiting where, where for the we're waiting for the toes. We're waiting, we're waiting for the toes. Where's the toes? Yes. Yeah. The stone will come and crush the toes, but the toes have to be acting like a governing authority before they'll be crushed. They will do that during the tribulation period because we even read in there that there are ten kings who will give their power to the Antichrist for a time. And it ends up being a short time because Messiah is going to put an end to it, just like the vision saw. It. So That's the accuracy close. of it is amazing. Close, close is amazing. Right the toes. That's we are absolutely, we're, we're right there on the edge of it, on the precipice of what we know will be the end time events as described in the book of Revelation. Yes. Wow. And in this statue and in Daniel 9 and Daniel 11 and, and many other of the prophets all speak to that same time with the same language. I don't remember, I derailed it. There was a thought I wanted to bring out. Um, oh, remember, yes, 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 this is important because remember when we've looked at 9, 10, and 11, we see that when God is raising up the Gentiles, what's the reason for that? Remember what the Gentiles are supposed to do? A plus, A plus, provoke Israel to jealousy. That's what is going on so that Israel wants back that position of being a priest to the world, to represent God to the world. Not to rule over and subjugate and make Gentile slaves any more than it's reversed right now. But the, the whole purpose was to provoke them to jealousy. Remember Paul said, I'm going to do all I can to win as many Gentiles as I can because when Israel sees more of you dear Gentiles coming in, then it's going to make my people yeah. jealous. Then they're going to want it. And that's what we have going on right now. With that in context, we can begin to understand now um, verse 26. I think we're ready for Yes. Verse 26 starts out with, and so all Israel will be saved. Now, keep that in context, because there's a horrible teaching out there that you don't need to share the, the testimony of salvation with the Jewish people, because see, it says here, all Israel will be saved. So don't worry about the Jewish people, and don't reach out to them, and they're blind right now anyway, they can't see, so don't waste your time, don't waste your effort. It's going to be okay. And I have even heard people say, well, the Jews have an in with God. They don't have to worry about it. They've got an in. It's right there. If you keep it in context, is all Paul saying any of the above? No. No. He would put in, if you heard that today, he put in another, God forbid, may it never be, anathema, don't say it, send it away. That's not his point. As a whole nation, yes, Israel will be saved. Israel will not see an end like, and I use the same names all the time, but they're the ones that come to mind, the Malachites and the Hittites and the Girgashites. And someone said the termites, but we still have termites. <laughs> okay, so it's not the termites. But yes, as a nation, God promised, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, there would never be a full end to the nation of Israel. All of Israel will be saved nationally. The kingdom will be set in Israel. And when 
Okay, I have to be careful how I say it because there will be a judgment for who goes into the kingdom and it will be the saved Jews that will go into that kingdom and along with them will be saved Gentiles because we have Gentiles get saved um, during the tribulation period also. But this is not talking about Israel just gets in because, because she's Israel. Keep it in that context. He's told them, I'm going to restore Israel. I'm going to restore the temple there. I'm going to set up my kingdom there. The nation will be saved. But individually, each one has to come to salvation the same way each Gentile has to come to salvation. Now, let's look at when that kingdom's going to begin. Let's go to Zechariah. Zechariah. Because remember I said the prophets deal with it. We want to go to chapter 12. Oops, okay, I'm having trouble with my fingers and my tablet. There we go. Zechariah chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 10. If you've been with me a while, you hear this verse again and again and again, but hopefully you'll get more depth of understanding. God is speaking. He says, I, I, God, will pour out on the house of David. Does that sound like he's pouring it out on Israel, on a Jewish location? Yeah. Yes. Okay, he's referring to David. If you don't think of it that from of it being Jewish from that phrase, the next phrase, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Okay, so God's going to pour out on those living in Jerusalem. He's going to pour out on the house of David. The house of David belongs in Jerusalem. That's their lineage. That's where they belong. What is he pouring out? The Spirit. That's him. That's the Ruch HaKodesh. He's pouring out his Spirit of grace. Remember grace, God's riches. Someone said at Christ's expense, but it is God's unmerited favor. He's pouring this out now on Israel, not because she merited it, but because he deals in grace. He's going to pour out the spirit of grace and a supplication. Supplication is our crying out to our God, pouring our hearts out. As they're pouring their hearts out to their God, which shows you their eyes are finally turning to the God of Israel. Look at Israel's history. Has she gone into captivity before? Yes. Why? Because of disobedience, because of rebellion, because of not paying attention and following and being obedient to her God. And what happens when she's in that rebellion? Does she die off and cease to be a people? No. Time, time again, she realizes, uh-oh, I don't like it out here. This is pretty nasty. I'm in trouble. Help, God. And she cries out to the God of Israel who hears her cry, raises her up a leader or a redeemer, brings her back, and even at times has brought her all the way back into the land again. Babylon and Assyria took Israel out of the land. In Daniel's day, we read that the 70 years of captivity was ending. Under Ezra and Hemiah, we read of their coming back into the land. We know in 1948, Israel became a nation again, a nation born in a day fulfilling the prophecy of Yeshua, Isaiah chapter 66, verses 7, 6 and 7, or 7 and 8 right there where it says that, that she would become a nation again. This has been established because God has started his work again to reestablish and to restore. But it's taking time. That didn't happen in just a day. Ezekiel, Ezekiel told us in chapter 37, they'll be back in the land, but what are they like when they're in the land? Dead bones. <laughs> okay, they're not alive. They're, they're, they look like skeletons. They look like they belong in the graves. And Ezekiel, Hezekiel is asked by God, can these bones live again? And, and he's like, I don't know, God, can they? And God shows them they will live again, that the Spirit of God would be put in them. What did we just hear? God's Spirit would be poured out. We know chapters 38 and 39 of Hezekiel deal with the Battle of Armageddon that shows us that it's not that they're ready yet, but what comes right after Armageddon, 40 through 48, is the huge uh, temple, bigger than there's ever been, described in detail where Messiah sits and rules. If he's sitting and ruling from his temple, the spirit has come back into those bones and they are living. This is for the ones who turn to him, the ones who are here being referenced because it says, 
as I go on in the verse, uh, verse 10 of, of Zechariah 12, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. Okay, God's still speaking. When was God pierced? Mm -hmm. Crucifixion. The Crucifixion. The cross. That's the only time we can see and say that God in human form called Yeshua Jesus suffered piercing. His hands and his feet and his side literally pierced. They're going to look on this one who was pierced. We know that we're going to see in Messiah throughout all of eternity, we're going to see nail prints in his hands and in his feet. It's going to be a constant reminder to us of the high price he paid for our salvation. As the Jewish people are mourning, they're, they're crying out to their God as they look to him to be their redeemer. They're turning back to him to get right with him. They're going to see, whoa, you were here. You did come. This is a second coming. That's why it says that they mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They'll weep bitterly over him like weeping bitterly over a firstborn. They miss their firstborn. The firstborn of God in position, in rank, in, in headship is what they're seeing and realizing, whoa, it was you. You are coming a second time. They're having that spiritual awakening. These are the ones, as they are awakened spiritually, who will embrace this, and they will be saved, the same as we are today, by believing in this, and they will be the ones that will go into the kingdom then and start the millennial kingdom. These are the ones that are saved. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1 says, When that day comes, when they finally have their eyes open, they're seeing and they're believing. By the way, eyes open, it's saying the partial blindness is gone. Now they're seeing, and they're seeing fully. And then when that day comes, a spring will be opened for the house of David. Are we talking about the same people chapter 12 talked about? Yes. Remember, it's one long letter. It's one long scroll. It's not start and stop like we do with chapters and verses. That spring will be open for the house of David, for the people living in Jerusalem. It sounds just like verse 10. To cleanse them from sin and impurity. That's telling us they've come to the Lord for the forgiveness of their sin. These are the believers who have come to believe now in their Messiah as their Savior. And they are the ones, again, who will go into the kingdom and start it. This is Matthew 25. Should I start with verse 31 and go through 46? You have the sheep and goat judgment. The sheep will go into the kingdom and the goats are cast out. What's the difference? Salvation. The ones who have received Messiah as Savior will go into the kingdom. That judgment itself is a very Jewish judgment. There is another judgment at another point. We talked about it before when we were dealing with it with, with Matthew that talks about the Gentiles that will go into the kingdom because there are both. But both that go into the kingdom, when that kingdom starts, are saved. Nobody gets into the kingdom who is not saved. They'll be the ones that are cast out. Okay, staying with Romans, though, so that we can actually finish Romans today. <laughs> I believe. I'm holding my breath. <laughs> so the sheep are all Jews? Yes. The and sheep and goat judgment. Gentiles. Not in the sheep and goat judgment. The Gentiles are, are we see in, in another judgment that's described in Matthew 25. But the sheep and goats are talking about the Jewish people. Okay. And, and if I took all the time to prove that and tell that today, we'd have to go back into that. I've done that before, so I'll leave that for either get it on a CD or talk to me later and we'll work away, you know, for you. Okay, so back here, back to um, verse 26. So we understand that when it's saying, so all Israel will be saved, we're talking about the nation of Israel is going to be saved. We know only the individuals who have personally put their faith in their Messiah are the ones who will enter into this kingdom. And it goes on and says, just as it is written. It stands written. It cannot be revoked. God doesn't take his word back. What he says, he does. He fulfills, he keeps. He doesn't break a word of it. So what did he say that stands written? The deliverer will come from Zion. Zion. That's the name for Israel. Where did Messiah come from? He came from Israel. He didn't come from India. He didn't come from the United States. He didn't come from Timbuktu. He came from Israel. He will remove ungodliness from Yaakov, from Jacob. I forgot to tell you, deliverer, by the way, means a rescuer. 
It means a redeemer. Now, if we keep redeemer in our Jewish context, we know how it does when redeem according to the law of the redeemer. It has to be a kinsman, has to be able to redeem, and has to pay the full price to redeem. Yeshua was and did each one of those. He was a kinsman. If Yeshua Jesus was not Jewish, he could not have been the Jewish redeemer. It had to be someone of Jewish blood. He had to be able to redeem. Was he able? Yes. Why was he able? Because he's God. Because he has sinless blood that can be shed in our place. What was the price paid and he had to be able to pay it all? In other words, when they would buy back the land, they had to be able to pay the full price. It couldn't say, well, I'll give you a down payment and I'll make monthly payments. It's paid in full. In the Greek, it's tetelestai, and you heard the Lord say it from the cross. It is finished. Done. Yeah. Complete. Paid in full. Bill stamp paid. Hallelujah. And any of you have a business and you've ever stamped a bill paid, you don't go back and collect for that later, do you? It's nope. done. Okay, so, as rescuer, as redeemer, as deliverer, Yeshua Jesus is the only one that has ever been able, being Jewish, able to redeem, and did do it, paid the price. Keeping that in mind, then we understand how he removed ungodliness from Yaakov. Jacob is another name for Israel as a nation. This is again speaking of their national restoration through, though, the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. Because remember, only the believers are going to come into that kingdom of Israel at the millennium and start it with the Lord. It will only be those who are believers. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. Okay, God's made a covenant with the Jewish people prior. He's saying this is when it's going to be fulfilled when I take away their sins because they've come to faith in me. What's he talking about? Well, let me take you all the way back to another prophet. Remember out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, we let a thing be established. Jeremiah has given us his view. Isaiah has given us his view. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31. And we're going to see Jeremiah, Jeremiah refers specifically to the covenant, the covenant that God made with his people. Go down with me to verse 33. Actually, you can read on your own starting with verse 27, because that tells us days are coming when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man, with the seed of beast, and it goes on. I want to skip in and bring you down. Uh, verse 31. Yeah. All right, let's start with 31. Behold, all right, in there, those of you with me in Revelation, remember, behold means wake up, pay attention, don't miss this, don't sleep, don't yawn, don't let your mind wander. This is a time to pay attention. Something really important is being said. Not that every word isn't important, but we all get it. So behold, days are coming. The Lord's declaring this. This is the word of the Lord. When I will make a, and don't miss this word, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Okay, I'm not going to make a covenant like the old one. The old one, verse 32, I made with their fathers. Who are their fathers? We go all the way back. We know we're talking Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in this case, we're going to see we're especially talking about the time of Moshe, Moses. Because it says here, I made this covenant with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. Okay, that's when Moses was raised up as a redeemer. He was a deliverer. He wasn't the redeemer because he didn't forgive them of their sins. But he was raised up to bring them out of Egypt. And God made covenant with them then. Remember, he gave them the law. Okay, but, and it's going to say, he made that covenant with them, but he's declaring this one's different. How is this covenant different than that covenant? Verse 33, but this is a covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law, I lost my place, within them, and on their heart I will write it. When God raised up Moses, where did he write it? Where did he write the law? In their heart. With Moses? Oh, on the tablets. On the tablets. The tablets of stone that are with them yeah. to this day, hidden in the Ark of the Covenant, which will be brought out in God's perfect timing. 
Now he's saying, I'm not going to write it on stone. I'm not going to write it externally. I'm going to write it internally. I'm going to write it on their hearts. And when I do that, you know what happens? I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they will not teach again every man and each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. They're not going to have to say to the others, You need to know the Lord. Instead, they're going to be saying, they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. At this point, when it's written in their hearts, they'll know it forever. That's what's being said. When does that happen for the nation? When Messiah has returned and sits on his throne, and those coming in are those who have it written on their hearts, and they will know the Lord forever. That's when, back in Romans, it goes right along with what, what Shaul Paul says in Romans 11 verse 26, that's when he removes the ungodliness from Yaakov, that's yeah, 26 and 27, he'll make this covenant when he takes away their sins forever. Now we know, personally, individually, when we come into saving faith, we have our sins forgiven forever now. We get to... The reality of that, no, I can't even say it that way. Um, we're promised it now, and we know it is ours. We, okay, how do I say it? We'll experience it when we've crossed over to be with the Lord in heaven. In other words, we still sin today, but we're forgiven for those sins. There's a day coming when, when that will be gone forever. But what we have right now it's as good as if we're living at home with the Lord. He sees us in that forgiven state. Okay? Amen. But he will take away the sins of Israel as a nation. The sins will be gone. We know that when we get past the millennium, there's one more little time when those who are of rebellious heart will have that opportunity to show that and turn against the Lord, and they will be done away with, and then we go on into an eternity sinless. Hallelujah. Who wants to live in sin forever? That's what is coming. And in case if I raised a question for you, you're thinking, well now wait a minute, who's rebelling? And I thought that we can't lose our salvation. No, you can't. The ones who rebel are the ones who never accepted it and believed in it and put it into their heart during the millennium were born because when the millennium starts, those people that go into the millennium are earthly people. They're still going to be able to procreate. They're going to raise children. Those children have to put their faith into the Lord the same way we have to individually put our faith into the Lord. You're not saved today because your mom and dad were saved. If you believe that and you think that you're a Christian because your parents were a Christian or because you were born in a Christian nation, nothing of the truth is in that statement. The same way for the, the children who are born during the millennium. They have to receive it personally. The ones who do will follow the Lord. They will live out the thousand years. It says you can live the whole time if you don't openly rebel. Well, if you see someone get cut down because they openly rebel, you may want to rebel in your heart, but you may decide, mm, I'm not going to show it. I'm going to wait for a time when it's safer to show it. And so they go through this thousand of years not expressing what's really true in their hearts. When they're given the chance, when Satan is let loose for a little time to go throughout the land to get those who want to follow him and declare him to be their God to come up in the face of our God, then they're going to join with him because in their hearts they've never had that, I love the Lord my God and I want him in his plan of salvation, they instead for some, I can't understand reason, can't imagine, can't imagine choose Satan, want him to be their God, want to come against the God of Israel who's done nothing but given them grace and mercy. And these are the ones who will openly rebel and God will stop them in a heartbeat, literally. They will go into judgment and they are gone forever. And that's when we go on into an eternity that will be sin free. Back on track for here though, because we're talking about this time at this point when the Messiah is returning and second coming. And we have, uh, I think we've completed verse 27. So verse 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, 
Okay, concerning the gospel. Paul's bringing us back on track to think about this. Now, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, and the they that he's referring to, keeping it in context, the Jewish people. Okay, he's talking as a whole. The Jewish people who have not come to believe, they are enemies for your sake. Okay, Israel as a whole, this nation is treated as an enemy. <clears throat> They're not for God. They're rebelling against God right now. They've rejected the Son as their Messiah. They've rejected Him as their salvation. And so as a whole, Israel is leading a rebellious life. And when you are in rebellion against the Lord, you're an enemy of the Lord. That's what's being said. And that is true right now. Not of every individual, but as a whole. Okay? But why are they enemies? It says they're enemies for your Gentile, you Gentiles, for your sake, for the sake of the Gentiles. Why? Because remember, through Israel's rebellion, the gospel's taken to the Gentiles. They're raised up to love it, to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. So it's really, in essence, they're temporarily looked at as an enemy for your sake, so that you Gentiles will be given the gospel. That's what's being said here, that from the standpoint of God's choice, that's election, God's elect, from the standpoint of God's election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, okay? So this, the beloved ones belong to God. So now what we're saying from the standpoint of God's choice, when we look at God's choice in reference to the elect, those of Israel who are the believing remnant are the elect, and of course in Gentiles it's the same way. Those who believe are the, are the elect, but right now we're talking about the, the Jewish elect. They're the beloved ones of God for the sake of the fathers. Who are the fathers? Again, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Who was the root? The root of that tree that the Gentile got grafted into, remember, of course, when we get all the way down to the root, we come to Messiah, but we, we said the root, the tree itself was Avraham, was yeah. Jewish. So what we're saying here is that um, for the sake of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, for the sake of the promises God made to them, for the sake of that everlasting covenant, they did all the way back with Avraham. Salvation given to the Gentiles is not to replace the Jewish people. It just, ah, uh, do I like postponed the Jewish people receiving their covenant promises. It, but I have to say that carefully because the Gentiles, it's the Jewish fault because they wouldn't accept that the Gentiles are in this position that Israel will gain back. So it's not that it's the Gentiles' fault. I don't want you to, to see it that way. It's the unbelieving Jewish heart that's at fault that caused God to open it up to the Gentiles. So it's a blessing for you Gentiles, and yet as you Gentiles are blessed and receive it, that's going to bring the original back. So you see how it never replaced? It never was an either or and the the ones that are coming back in will be grafted back in we talked about that last week also remember the scripture made it very clear that the, what's been cut off would be grafted back in to its own root also the jewish people will come back notice very clearly god keeps his word to abraham keeps his word to isaac keeps his word to jacob so he's going to keep those promises for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevo irrevocable. Okay, the gifts that are being referred to here, this is favor with God. This isn't a merit that somebody earned. It's not saying that, that you know, God gives us all gifts. It's not saying because you've got this gift. What it's saying is that God's, by God's grace, okay, and that's what the word gift comes from. It's not meaning that he's given you a special endowment, a special talent, or something like that. It's just simply because God graced you. He graced you to be able to receive, because it says that gift, that grace of God, and the calling of God. And again, this is not, 
You're called to an occupation. This is not, I've called you to be this and I've called you to be that. This calling is talking about salvation. He's called us, us all to salvation, Jew and Gentile. And that's what's being referred to here. Is this his invitation to be part of that messianic kingdom is on the basis of his grace. Not on the basis of you being a good teacher or a good this or a good that. Not on the basis of you earning it in any way, shape, or form. This is strictly and totally on the basis of God's grace. What God has gifted is you to have the ability to receive salvation. To those who he has called, you can receive this gift. And that's why he says his gift and his calling you to salvation, that's irrevocable. Without repentance, he's not going to change his mind. If it's irrevocable, it can't be changed around. When you have a revocable trust, changes can be made. When you have an irrevocable trust, nothing can be made. You can't um, addendum it, nothing. It is as it is. God is giving us security here. Saying, I'm not going to change my mind. I'm not going to decide one day you can be saved and the next day you can't. And I've got those who I've chosen, who I've called. He's got a promise for them. He's got a destiny for them. He's got a future for them. And he's going to deliver. That's what we're seeing. And again, on what basis? Let's look and let's see. Verse 30. For just as you were once... And this is talking to you, dear Gentiles, okay? Just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their, the Jewish disobedience, okay? Let's break it down. You Gentiles, formally, before Paul wrote this, you were disobedient. You didn't believe. You didn't allow yourselves to be persuaded. You weren't complying with. You were refusing to believe. You were being disobedient. You were being Stubborn and stiff-necked. Uh, Where have I heard that expression before? <laughs> For the Jewish people. But do you see God saying you dear Gentiles are the same way? He doesn't say that you're better. He says you also, for a time, were just as stiff-necked, just as stubborn, just as disobedient, refusing to believe. That's where your attitude was. Okay? So these also have been, I lost my place, I'm trying to find it again. Okay, for just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now been shown mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. God looks at the stubbornness of the stiff neck and he says, you deserve death. You deserve me to squeeze you. You deserve me to say, so long, farewell, goodbye. <laughs> but he doesn't. He says that there's something called mercy in here. Mercy, they are the recipient of mercy. It shows the Gentiles didn't earn their salvation. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? Did the Jews earn their salvation? No. Were the Jews stubborn and stiff-necked? Yes, everybody says that. But God's saying, Jew and Gentile, you both, you didn't merit it. You didn't earn it. You didn't do better. I didn't look down and say, wow, those Jews, they really blew it. And look at my wonderful Gentiles. They're such good little examples. I got all my teacher's pets. <laughs> he didn't. He looked and he saw that they were just as stubborn, just as disobedient, but because of his mercy, because of that, he reached out to the Gentiles, the same as to the Jews, and brought them into salvation. I'll get your question in just a second. So these also now, oops, sorry, okay, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also, oh no, I do need to back up. See, 30 and 31 are too much alike. Okay, we've done 30. You Gentiles were once disobedient to God. Now you've been shown mercy because they were disobedient. So while they were disobedient, and God had to bring them to, to their wit to realize that and used you to do it, that's what we're seeing in, in verse 30 then. So verse 31, so those also now that have been disobedient, okay, I'm sorry, I'm really having trouble with this and my eye is not helping me right now. Okay, I got a hair in it. Um, so these also now have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you Gentiles, okay, so the disobedient ones now are the Jews, 
that because of the mercy shown to you Gentiles, they also may now be shown mercy. Guess what? God's plan worked. <laughs> Are you surprised? I'm not. God's smart. <laughs> he knows it. He planned it. He did it. And by virtue of bringing in the Gentiles, he has provoked at least some Jews, hopefully more, to jealousy that they'll want this gift of salvation also. So it's because of, it's um, through or because of the Jews disobedience that the Gentiles came in came in into God's mercy how did the Jews get it by God's mercy also not by their earning it but by their coming to that hey I I let go of something I shouldn't have so you see how it's mercy that's drawing both groups that's what we're being seen what we're being told verse 32 for God has shut up all okay who's all Everybody. Everybody. Jew, Gentile. Everybody. God has shut up all in disobedience. Okay? He's put you in a hole. He has shown you whether you're Gentile or whether you're Jewish, this is you. You've blown it. You're disobedient. You're stiff-necked. You're stubborn. You are not right with me. And no difference, no difference. Get past the skin color, get past the whatever. You got a heartbeat, you're in that group. That's it. All are in that group. They've all been shut up in that disobedience so that he can say, I'm done with y'all. I'm going to wipe you out. I'm going to raise up a new people. I'm going to do a new thing. No. He says, I've, I've brought you all into that, that pit of disobedience so that he, God, may show mercy to who? To who? Everyone. To everyone. Not just to the Jew. Not just to the Gentile. But to all. So I brought you all in. I showed you all whether you came from this background that was Gentile, heathen worship, whether you came from the Jewish background where you should have known and followed the God of Israel. You're both in the same camp, in the same boat. You, you, I'm going to say you're in the same boat. You got a hole in the boat and you got your oars broken off. You're going down. But God's saying, I've got mercy. I've got mercy for you all. Dear Jew, dear Gentile, all are being brought into the mercy. You've all been corralled. There's no way to escape. It's in order that God's mercy can be shown. Okay? When you're in that need for mercy, you realize it's God's grace. What saves us? God's grace. By being shut up to disobedience, we realize we all need the grace of God. We're all saved by the same principle. For by grace are you saved through faith. That's what he's saying. If the Jews had come to the right place and were accepted on the basis of their works, then the Gentiles would be shut out because they didn't have the law. They didn't have the works to do to merit a position with God. You dear Gentiles would have been left out if the Jews did it right. But God knew better. And he knew they wouldn't do it right. And he allowed it to go that way so that he could bring in his other group that he loved just as dearly. That he died for just like he died for the Jew. Because he so loved the whole world. Because he so loved the whole world. Eric got it. It's for all, all who will accept. For God so loved whosoever. For God so loved the whole world. Go with me also to Galatians 3 and verse 22. And in Galatians 3 and verse 22. Can I ask a question before you go on? Let me read the verse and then you can. But before, whoops, verse 22, but the scripture has shut up everyone under sin. That's what I just said. So that the promise by faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Not saying it might be given to the Jews, not saying it might be given to the Gentiles, it's given to those who will believe. Okay, Pam, what's your question? 
I heard a minister say on TBN that no Gentile has ever been his sheep. Is this true? When he calls the sheep the lost sheep of the house of Israel, mm -hmm. then he's talking about Jewish sheep. But I'll tell you, like he told, uh, I think it was Kepha, it was his Talmudim anyway, I have sheep, sheep that in, yeah, in other flocks that you're totally unaware of. Mm -hmm. So, but usually when you see the sheep being referred to, it's Jewish terminology. The sheep in God's judgment of Matthew 25, I told you, is the but sheep are, are Jewish. Are the sheep in other, er, other parts of the Bible? The Lord is my shepherd. I oh, shall yeah. not want. Okay. Oh, That's not that, just that Jewish sheep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> he is the chief shepherd. He's the great shepherd. The great shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, and the chief shepherd's the one returning for his his sheep they're all brought in they're different flocks mm -hmm. in other words the Jew doesn't become a Gentile and the Gentile doesn't become the Jew mm -hmm. but like I say anytime it refers to the lost sheep of the house of Israel that that is specifically Jewish at that point but overall yeah overall we're, we're you can be his Jewish. little sheep well, yes absolutely we were until I heard that preachers say we weren't yeah like, because he's referring to those scriptures but but you have to look beyond because when David said the Lord is my shepherd and when we know that he uses the analogy the shepherd and the sheep that that extends beyond a Jewish mm -hmm. that's a and there had to be Gentile shepherds in the in the old, in the Bible as well as Jew I have yes, no or, idea. yes or no I have no idea they were in Israel that we hear them talked about, but that doesn't mean... No. I'm, I'm, I would think, like you, I would think there probably were, but again, when he re refers to them, and, and why would he need to say of the house of Israel mm -hmm. if all the sheep always were only Israel, then that would be redundant. So I think even that definition shows that he's got other sheep. I started to say it'd be like your white sheep and your black sheep, but I can't do that because then everybody's going to say, well, I don't want to be the black sheep. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but no, you can, you can absolutely call him your shepherd and be his little sheep. Absolutely. Oh, scripture gives you room for that. Now, what scripture did you find that Gentiles were stiff-necked? What scripture was that? I missed it. Right here in uh, Romans 11, start with verse 30. 30. Yeah, 30 through 32 brings out Gentile is disobedient, been shown mercy because of the disobedience of the Jews, um, and then and that each got mercy because of the other, and God shut us all up. So you have to start with verse 30. Verse 30, okay. Yeah. Okay, now, because I am going to start fighting time and I don't want to leave a verse. So if, you, if you're still questioning, I'll go back over with you at the end. But let's go on, okay? We've just ended, and I want you to keep it in that context. We've just ended on that note, God has shown mercy to all. Paul's feeling that. He's feeling it. I hope you're feeling it. Are you realizing right now, because of his mercy extended to you, you have salvation. You're guaranteed it. You're not having to worry every day, am I doing it enough right? Am I being good enough? Have I done enough good deeds? You're, it's all done for you by his mercy, by his grace. And what does that cause Paul to do? His heart starts singing. Okay, I can't sing. I can't carry a tune, but I can sing like Paul. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. God's, I'm sorry, Paul's argument concerning God's elective grace. Remember he said that he's elected. He chose by election. He, you don't come to God without his calling you. He's called you. He's chosen you. You're to be faithful. That is election of God, that saving grace that God has brought to Paul has taken him from feet on earth. He is soaring through the heavens right now. He is just ready to explode. It says the depth of the riches, the riches is wealth. He is not talking gold and silver. He's not talking the number of houses he owns, the number of businesses he has. He is talking about riches that are out of this world. The rich, the richness of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. 
This is so rich. Let me finish the, the verse and I'll keep breaking it down. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unfathomable his ways. Paul's pulling out all his big words. He's got to lift the lid off of the box because it can't be contained. It is unsearchable. That means that when he says how deep it is, go as deep as you want to get and you can't exhaust still being in the midst of God's riches. That's how deep it is. You can't hit bottom. You may hit bottom in your earthly life here, but in the riches of God's glory promised to you by His grace, you can't go past His riches. His judgments, that's His decisions, His ways, the roads and the paths, all of this are unfathomable. That means I can't fathom it. I can't figure it out. I can't follow it. It's untraceable. It can't be tracked. It can't be followed. It can't be copied. What he's saying is God's plan is out of this world. He has chosen that for us. You are in the midst of the wealth of our God. And it, no matter whether you understand or not, His decisions, His ways, the path He leads you down are, are the greatest. They may not seem like it to you because you're looking here like a two-year-old thinking, you know how to tell mom and dad what they should be doing for you. That two-year-old doesn't know. Don't think for a minute when something isn't the way you think it should be that God has forgotten you or left you, that you've exhausted his riches. No, if you cling to him, you will see, wow, when you look back, you're going to say, that was the best way. It might not have been the easiest way. It might not have been the most comfortable way, but it was the best way. God is so wise. He is so good. There's a song out that, that, that hits this. Um, if I'd known, I would have... Uh, print out the words for me to remember, but in essence it's when you can't see his hand, when you don't know his plan, trust his heart. And that's the name of the song, that's the refrain, trust his heart. And that's what Paul's saying here, his ways are unfathomable, it's unsearchable. Go to the heights of heaven, go to the depths, go to the core of the earth, go to the depths underneath the earth, go wherever you want. Remember David said, wherever I go God, you're there. I can't get away from you. I don't care where I go. Even if I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. Because he's on the comfort side of Sheol. He's not in hell. Hell is literally the only place God isn't, and that's what makes it hell. <laughs> this is our God. This is salvation that he's given you. Paul's just ready to explode. Let me take you real quickly to Isaiah. Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 40. And if you've not heard the study on this whole chapter, get the whole study. It's a long study, but it is wow. I mean, if you can touch ground when you get done studying that one, I don't think you got a heartbeat. I don't think you're touching ground with human feet. Just in the middle of this, just in verses 13 and 14, it says, Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Who has his counselor, or as his counselor has informed him, okay? Who's told the Spirit of the Lord how to do something? Who's been able to be a counselor to God? Obviously, it's the idea is, are you kidding me? We all know, how could we counsel God? Yet, watch your mouths because we do it all the time. Oh God, you shouldn't do it this way. God, why did you do that? I got an issue with you, God. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to be his counselor and trying to say, hey, I'm pulling you up short. You didn't do it right. But who has, who's, who's able to do that? Who can direct the yeah, Spirit of the Lord? You made me a girl and I want to be a boy. <laughs> <laughs> who taught him in a path of justice and taught him knowledge? Did you teach God the right way? Did you teach God the way of knowledge? Who informed him of the way of understanding? And the answers are nobody. God is ahead of it all. He is head of it all. He is so... Okay, are you ready? <laughs> My favorite word, ineffable. <laughs> <laughs> this is our ineffable God. He's too big to even be fit into a word. He is too great to be confined. I've got to take the ocean and I've got to put it in the size of a teacup. 
and I can't do that any more than I can tell you how great is our God. His ways beyond our ways, His riches beyond our, our we can't even see and understand, and, and it, it, it's just, I'm out of words. I know you'll laugh, but I'm out of words because there are no words. That's what Paul is saying. He, in essence, was out of words too unsearchable, unfathomable. This is our God. And it gets even better because we go into verse 34. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? See a quote right out of Isaiah. Who's a debtor to the Lord? Who, who or, I'm sorry, he's saying who is the Lord a debtor to? That's what he's saying. Does the Lord owe you? Does the Lord owe any of us? Does the Lord need to pay any of us back? We all know how crazy that is. That's what he's telling us. Who was first given to him that he might be paid back to him again? Nobody. None of us are there. Because the truth of the matter is verse 36. <clears throat> For from him, out of him, he is the source. He is the source of the entire universe, people. He spoke it into being. He is the source, the originator, the creator. It is all for, from Him and through Him. He's the agent. He's the guide. He's the one for this entire universe. Makes it all make sense. Works it all together for His good. He is the one that is... It all, it all starts with him and it goes through him. And it is all to him. And that's what it says. From him, through him, and to him are all things. Everything. There isn't anything that doesn't belong to him because he's the creator of it. He's the sustainer of it. He's the one that made the plan. He's the one that came up with salvation. Knowing <coughs> before he even created it all knowing there was going to be the need. He says, before the foundations of the world were formed, he planned death, burial, and resurrection of the Son of God to purchase us as kinsman redeemer for our salvation. Wow! And where does that leave us? To him be the glory forever. I don't know about you, but in my heart right now, I am on my face bowed before my God and all I can say is thank you thank you thank you and then Paul puts the stamp on it amen which means so be it that's it it is said what did you say Eric? truly said, truly said. I like that that's even better than it is said that's what it's taken him to. It's taken him to the highest mountain and then some. It's taken him to the depths of the sea and he can't run out of the richness and the greatness and the majesty of the almighty thoughts of our God. And he's prepared it all for every individual that has ever lived has that opportunity to have that fellowship with him, to be led by him and directed by him. And I could go on and on and on. And you know what? I've just started. I've just barely scratched the surface of our great God. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. I've got a few minutes. I'm going to do something real fast that, that comes right on the heels of it. Where did I put it? There we go. Um, I love when the Holy Spirit moves on people's hearts at the same time and the messages come in all kinds of directions that are the same thing. I tuned in to Adrian Rogers on Sunday. He's oh, home with the Lord him. now. I love, love him too. Him. I, don't, I don't get to hear him every Sunday. This time I got a chance to and my antenna went up immediately when I heard that he was on Romans 9, 10, and 11. And I went, ooh, I wonder what he's got to say. Let me hit you some highlights. I printed out, so I'm giving credit where credit's due. This is Adrian <laughs> Rogers, but I love how he put it. He started out with, no, God is not through with the Jews. In spite of what some people would say or have them believe, and he says, I'll give you five proofs from his word, and that's what he's going to give. He says, the world forever wrestles with the promise of the Holy Land. Is that not true? Yeah. It, it, Israel is the contentious point for, for this world. But he says, the only voice that matters, there's only one voice that matters, and it's the voice of God. 
He brought out the point that almost 100% of Bible prophecy relates to the land and the people of Israel. It's the focal point of the headlines worldwide. All eyes focus on this little nation, and he, Adrian's words, well they should, for Israel is the land and the people of destiny. And then he said, as the Jew goes, so goes the world. Israel is God's yardstick, his outline, his program, and his prophecy for all other nations. So when I asked in my text to you today, what does it, this have to do with you when we're looking at Israel's promised future and that God keeps his word? I tell you, this is for you also because as God deals with the Jew, so deals he with the Gentile. As God keeps his word here, so keeps his word here. If God decides to drop the Jew, then God could decide to drop the Gentile, Christian, whatever word you want to put in there, but that's not how our God is. So yes, we look at Israel for the example and we learn from her. We learn, first of all, that that she physically is the world's geographic center. She's the bridge between Asia, Africa, and Europe. She's the military and economic crossroads. She's the geographic center of the world. She's the spiritual center because most of the Bible was written in Israel by Jewish people. And Yeshua Jesus, who was born, crucified, resurrected, and ascended back into heaven, did so from the land of Israel. When he returns, he's returning to the land of Israel, the Mount of Olives, to Jerusalem. It's the prophetic center. You don't understand Bible prophecy or what God's doing in the world apart from Israel and what God is doing with Israel. It's also the storm center of the world. The clouds of Armageddon that we are already seeing starting to gather will center in Israel. But it's also the center for peace. One day, Israel will be the head nation, the center of peace, and that peace will go out to the world. She is also the glory center because it says the law will go forth from Zion. Yeshua Jesus will reign on this earth from Jerusalem. Romans 9, 10, 11 makes it very clear God isn't done with the Jews. The covenant rested not on man's performance, not on the Jews' performance, but it depended on the character of God and his eternal plan. And God's dealings with Israel throughout history prove the Jews are a God-created, loved, called, elected, and protected people. And I say, Amen. If you want to prove to someone there is a God, point to the Jew. If it were not for God, there'd be no Jew. He goes on, he says, Neither Washington, Moscow, nor London is Earth's most important city. Jerusalem, Israel's capital. Amen? Yes. yes. <laughs> Then he brought out from Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 3, I brought out verse 10, but in verse 3 it talks about that the, the nations press, pressure Israel to sacrifice her sovereignty and make Jerusalem an international city. But we're told in 12.3, Jerusalem will be a burdensome stone to the nations, to the world, until those end times come. So then he goes on into chapter 11 now and gives the five proofs. First proof that he gives is God's convicting power. The power of God is so convicting that it took Shaul Paul, a Jew, and it brought him to salvation and to bring the message of salvation to evangelize the pagans, to evangelize the Gentile world. Remember, Paul was raised up as the missionary to the Gentiles. And that's what God is doing with Israel. Supernaturally, he appeared to the people of Israel. Supernaturally, he brought Israel back into the nation in a day. And supernaturally, they will be the spiritual center where the world will understand in time coming. So his, his convicting power convicts people throughout all time. We see the, the Jewish people who came to, to believe and we see the Gentiles who proselyted into Judaism by God's convicting power to come to that salvation. And we see it all the way to the end when I read you Zechariah 12 10 when they see him whom they, they, they see him pierced and they'll mourn for him. Okay, at that time. The Jews in that day will see the resurrected, glorified Lord Jesus just like Shaul Paul saw him on the road to Damascus. Paul became the witness to the Gentile nations, but 144,000 Jews will be witnesses to the 
world. That power that saves. God still has a place, a purpose, and a ministry for his people, the Jews, and he's actively carrying out his plan for them. God's plan never gets put on hold and never runs into <laughs> turbulence even. Number two, God's um, careful preservation. God has always preserved a remnant. Now, I'm going to say specifically, God's always preserved a remnant of believing Jews because that's what we're talking about in relation to Israel. God is the one who's preserved Israel. No other nation out of their land for 2,000 years has remained a nation. They lose their identity, but God kept his hand on the people and through his preservation, the Jew not only came back into the land, but came back into the land as a Jew. And they will endure forever. Psalm 89 verses 27 to 29, you can read on your own, but it talks about hit the throne enduring forever. And it will be, well, he'll make David his firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And then it goes on and says it will continue forever. He said that, that to Israel, that if they did not stay in obedience to him, he never said, I'll end you. He said, I will child train you. I will take you out to the woodshed. And most people yeah. will say, oh, well, that's what the tribulation is all about, to beat up bad Israel. No, no, no. The tribulation falls on the world. It's God's judgment against sin. But where do we see God take Israel to the woodshed? How about the last 2,000 years? How about they, because they're not in right relationship with him, they have suffered consequences because of it. And we see that continue on. I could give you example after example in the last 2,000 years, but I think you are smart enough to figure them out on your own, so I won't take time right now. He says, nevertheless, even though they're a rebellious people, even though I have to take them out to the woodshed, nevertheless, hear that word because that's the whole crux on it my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him nor allow my faithfulness to fail God's careful preservation his seed endures forever they were scattered but not destroyed Egypt's king couldn't diminish them nor could the Red Sea drown them Jonah's whale, or whatever the big fish was, couldn't digest them, and the fiery furnace couldn't devour them. Haman's gallows couldn't hang them, and the nations couldn't assimilate them. Nor could dictators annihilate God's ancient people, the Jews. God always preserved a remnant. I say hallelujah, it's God. Amen. Point three is God's controlling plan. The Jew was to be his pipeline through. He was to bring salvation to the world through the Jew. Now he's using the Gentile salvation to provoke his own people and fulfill his magnificent plan. Notice, not derail and not plan B, but to fulfill his plan. Proof four, God's continuing promise. He said if Abraham is God's, then the whole tree belongs to God. Remember you have that lump, and because the lump was given to God, it made the whole holy. In that same way, God has kept his people. He will bring his people back in his time, and he will fulfill all as Messiah that he has promised. And that brings us to the fifth point, God's culminating purpose. God said salvation is both for the Jew and it's for the Gentile. In his mysterious plan, remember the hidden mystery that was now unveiled, blindness happened to Israel in part until, key words, don't miss every word in scripture, in part and until the number of Gentiles, that, that body was, was completed, and then God's plan is back on that track to bring Israel to the point that God had planned all along. So the church body is complete, it's caught up, and God's plan is continuing for those who trust him that are, are Jewish, they will see it, it, the Messiah return. I'm talking about after rapture. They will see the Messiah return because he keeps his purpose through the Son. 
the Son carries out this will that we have seen. I could give you many more verses. I Most of them I've given in my study. That it was Zechariah's verses and, and Romans 11 all over the place. That it's for his purpose. It's through his Son. It's according to his word. It's for his glory. And it's by his grace. The same power that convicted Paul one day will convict Israel. And the nation will turn as a whole. But it's preserving them through this time, even like he kept them in Elijah's day. And Elijah thought, I'm the only one. And God says, I've got 7,000 more that haven't bowed the knee to Baal, to Baal. God has repeatedly intervened for his people in the 2,000 years of being taken to the woodshed. He's also intervened to protect them because the prophetic promises are becoming reality. Hang on, folks, because the best is yet to come. And what is that best? That is, yes, we go in rapture. Yes, the tribulation is a horrible time. But then we come to the, what God wanted. And that is where Israel will be the priestly nation taking the gospel to the world. We'll see the world live in peace with Messiah on the throne. We go through that little time of rebellion for those who I already described are not wanting to follow God's plan. And then we come to the point, those who are without stand before God at the great white throne judgment. They receive what they, is due them for all of eternity. And we go on into an eternity with no sin. Hallelujah. Amen. God's plan perfected. And we see it through his line in his hand with the Jew. Hallelujah. Yeah, I think Adrian Rogers came out with a great message. I love it. And it was so relevant to us. I knew I could do it quick. I said Romans is a good study. Romans is. It's a great, great book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the Lord. It's great scripture. <laughs> so, are there questions? Are there comments? Believe it or not, I, I'm quitting almost on time today. That's that's a rare <laughs> occurrence. I'm looking for hands. Um, Roger, are they unmuted? They can unmute themselves, yes. You can unmute yourself. You can make your comments. I hope it has been a blessing. We see God's faithfulness. We see God's mercy. We see God's grace. I get as excited as Paul. Oh, I can't begin to cover it. it it's higher and greater. It's deeper. It's wider. It, every dimension and then some. That's, that's our God. And I'm so thankful. It's not dependent on us. On me. Because I, I couldn't make it 24 hours. But it's dependent on His grace and His mercy. No comments? Did I put you to sleep? I have never had a room so quiet. I don't know what to do with quiet people, so I'm not talking. I'll close in prayer. I'll close in prayer and then we'll open to the comments. Okay. Oh, Lord, our God. How we thank you that we can even say that, our God. That you are our God and we are your people. We thank you for your perfect plan. We thank you that it never excluded the Gentiles, that it took them in from the very beginning, that your plan with the Jewish people has never been thwarted and never will be. God, you are the one that we can count on. You are faithful, you are true, and you are amazing. You are ineffable, and we love you a little bit more, and we thank you with a little more depth in our hearts because, yes, we can't measure the depth, the heights, the, the width, anything of the greatness of our God. We just want to praise you. We want to thank you. We want to sing your hallelujahs. Praise to you forever and ever. And thank you that one day, soon I believe, we will see you face to face to be able to express this with a new body that will not be limited, not run out of words, and not, not have to stop, but continue forever praising our holy God. You who are faithful, thank you that you keep your word to the Jew and you keep your word to us too. In your precious name, uh, we give thanks. Amen. 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 Amen.